I'm going to try to remember that. I'll try to do more. People want to hear your music. They want to hear you talk. So this is called an auto harp. It was made by a friend of mine. He gave it to me. And I'm going to play some auto harp music for you. When I was in uh, grammar school, the teachers would teach us to read music um, with the auto harp. And I never learned to read music, unfortunately. I have some type of uh, an ability to learn to read music. But they would try to teach us with this. And then years later, um, whenever I would hear an auto harp, it would take me back to those days in grammar school when I was trying to learn and everybody's getting it and I'm not getting it. Do you remember math class when you didn't get it as a kid and all the kids were getting it and you're not getting it and these hot tears come down your cheeks? I don't know. Does anybody remember that? Yeah, me too. It's like a weird thing. But I'm not, I don't want to just talk about myself tonight. So this isn't, you know, it, but anyway, so when I got to medical school, I found this thing called the gastrocolic auto harp reflex that's actually induced when people play the auto harp and they get vertigo from bringing back that experience. <laughs> Everything I say tonight is probably true. I wouldn't look it up on ChatGPT. This is two songs. One is about 30 years old, the other is 300 years old. It's a little medley.
recognize what those what those two songs were? That's right. Yen Bach, yeah, Yezu Joy Man's Desire. Uh, thank you. That makes me feel better when somebody can recognize them. If, they, if I play that and they don't know, I think I didn't do a very good job if they didn't recognize it. I have a self-esteem problem. I'll just admit it right now before we get any further on the show. I'm just kidding. Um, but if you don't buy my CDs, I might go home and be depressed. That's the worst advertisement. To me. Okay, so this here is an octave mandolin. I'm going to play a lot of different instruments that you might not have heard of. An octave mandolin is an octave larger than a traditional um, little mandolin. A little mandolin is from here to here. A mandola is from here to here, and an octave mandolin is from here to here. A mandolo, mandocello is like this. They're huge. They're really big. So this is an octave mandolin. And these are um, really expensive. I had to sell a motorcycle to afford this. And uh, I'm going to work on a song about that sometime. It's uh, this little tune I wrote called Storm Over Del Marva. And it's based on a vacation I had one time. My kids were little. We went to the shore for a week. And it rained the entire time. And um, I didn't mind because it was the only time. I had a, a pretty busy job at the time. So that week off was the only time I had to do music. So I brought all my instruments, and uh, so I had a fun time, and I wrote this song on that vacation. They did not have as much fun as I did, so it's an instrumental. Come far tonight to get here? No, no, no. no. That's good. So, so it's not a real big waste. <laughs> I came from Allentown, so it wasn't too bad. I live in a town called Orfield near Dorney Park. Have you ever heard of that one? Yes. Yeah. Everybody's heard of Dor Dorney Park. Yeah. Um, huh? I think it is. Actually, there was an article in the paper today that they're going to require people 15 and under to have a chaperone. So if you show up there and you're 14 and you don't have somebody with you, because I guess they've been having problems, unfortunately. So uh, things are changing, I guess. So this is a, I'm gonna do a little old time tune. Um, old time is a, a style of music. Is anybody familiar with old time music? It's a sort of a, a genre with fiddles and banjo and mandolin. And it's music probably before 1930s. And they call it old time. It's kind of like bluegrass, but not exactly. It's more instrumental and less uh, focused on the on the lyrics. Um, so this is a an old time tune. It was actually written in 1980, but the gentleman who wrote it, um, he recorded it. And when he recorded it, he digitally put, or at the time I don't know, he did this. He superimposed the sound of a 78 with all the cracks on the record. He put that on the cassette that he did it on. And he handed it to his friends. I just found this old time tune. They listened. 
it's really cool. And then finally he said, well, actually, I just wrote it. <laughs> so, so this is called Winter Slide, which is it's just a pretty little song. So I started playing harmonica in uh, fourth or fifth grade. My dad would play harmonica, and he was really good. He played like the kind of cowboy harmonica where he, you know, cut it with his hands. And one day I was in my garage in sixth or seventh grade, and I discovered the blues. And boy, I never looked back. He didn't get it. He didn't know what. Well, and he's like, what are you doing that for? And I just, anyway, um, but I did learn how to do that beautiful kind of cowboy harmonica for my dad. It's just called Winter Slide, and I don't know why I said that. I guess I'm going to live somewhere. jar or a banjo they used to call them banjars they're originally from africa came over probably through the slave trade they originally were on gourds they were made on gourds and then uh, eventually they started using steel strings and then a guy named adam sweeney in the 1860s put this little fifth string on it and the style that i'm going to do is something called um claw hammer which is a little different it's not that scrubs fast bluegrass thing it's, um, it's a little different style I learned in high school. And I grew up in northern New Jersey, but the weird thing is I um, sort of resonated more with the music of the Appalachian Mountains in the south. You know, it's kind of weird. Uh, I did go through a rock and roll phase. I was just talking to a friend who I haven't seen since, in, since 1976. Rich uh, and his wife came and their daughter came tonight. And I haven't seen Rich since high school. And... Um, but I was telling him a story. I, I was really into Black Sabbath when I was in seventh and eighth grade. And uh, I had really long hair, and uh, as much as my parents could allow when I was in eighth grade. And I remember uh, trying to learn, you know, Iron Man and all the riffs on bass and stuff. And I was kind of, uh, kind of going in a darker direction musically as well as uh, pharmacologically at the time. And uh, then I had this conversion experience. I, I had a, I went to a Bible study and and had a, had a conversion, which was uh, good in many respects, and sort of gotten straightened out. And, uh, but the bad thing was they thought rock and roll was of the devil. And oh man, that was like my heart was been playing music. And they said anything above the third fret was of the devil. So you can only play, <laughs> you can only play above, just to the third fret after that. I don't know, you know, it's like, so, but the beauty of that is it caused me to get into acoustic music banjo so I sold my sold my bass and cut my hair and uh, and got a mandolin for Christmas and uh, the year that I got the mandolin for Christmas um, two weeks before Christmas I broke both my arms in a unfortunate accident during gym class 
And um, so my parents presented me with this mandolin. They had a sort of dark sense of humor, my parents, you know. And they presented me with a mandolin with a kind of glint in their eye, and I'm sitting there under the Christmas tree and Marm casts like that. And said, Can't wait till this cast comes off so I can play it. But I learned to play it anyway, anyway, despite the broken arms. And uh, and I, I have very thin wrists because of, I had broken this arm three times before that, so I'm kind of a clumsy person. But we're not here to talk about me tonight. How are you guys doing? You're okay so far? Nobody's looking for a sharp object to, to okay, that's good. I also like your shoes a lot. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, so, you know what, I have an idea. I'm going to stop playing and just <laughs> tell stories all night. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I now have seven more minutes. <laughs> no, I think about that. <laughs> all right, so, this is a banjo. It's, I'm going to play a little tune I wrote called uh, The New Car Smell. It's a true story, pretty much. Um, it got played on Car Talks, NPR's Car Talk, back in 2006 as their bumper music. And we're driving in the car with my kids listening to NPR. And I'm hoping, hoping they're going to play it on the listen to Car Talk. And it came on, and my kids said, hey, Dad, that's you, isn't it? And they were like in middle school and high school, you know. And so I was definitely not cool, you know. And they said, that's really cool. So about seven and a half minutes, my kids thought I was something. I relished every 7.5 seconds of that. So this is called the new car smell. It's about the first new car I ever had. When I got my new car and I drove it off the lot, I spilled my cup of coffee and it was steaming hot. The aroma of the coffee beans and the cream as it did rot.
never even been a possibility. The aroma of this sweet old earth is more my cup of tea. Got a compost pile growing underneath my seat. Got a compost pile growing underneath my seat. Somewhat of a true story. I wouldn't say it's totally true. There's maybe a little bit of exaggeration in there. They didn't like, my kids didn't like me driving to school because we'd have to unfog the windows in the morning because of the organic growth in the car. So I um, couldn't one figure out why they'd want to walk two miles to school instead of getting a ride. I guess I, I have allergies, so I didn't smell it. So This is, um, this is a guitar which you may recognize. I live about 17 miles from the Martin Guitar Factory, which is amazing. Um, Martin guitars were very expensive, and I always wanted one, but I grew up kind of poor. So I went to medical school so I could become a doctor to afford a Martin guitar, um, which was a very ill-fated venture, uh, because two things I discovered. One is that, um, well, I'm not, I'm not going to go into it. <laughs> but uh, so what happened is, um, it turns out they don't make as much as I thought they did, doctors. <laughs> I'm not going to cry poor mouth, okay? <laughs> so I found a, I got into a band when I was up in the area, in the Allentown area, and some of the guys worked at the factory, and I discovered they could uh, get the guitars at a discount. Sometimes if they had a little flaw, they would find their way out the back door of the factory. But don't ever tell anybody I told you that, or I'd have to come after you. So um, they're supposed to destroy him like Stradivarius did with his defective fiddles. So this is a defective Martin that I got from one of my friends. And after I got it for like, you know, a fraction of the cost, I go, man, I went to medical school, 11 years of training. <laughs> oh, well, it all worked out anyway. I'm not going to complain. But, uh, so what were we talking about? Guitars. Oh, yeah, Martin guitars. So I love Martin guitars. And uh, don't tell anybody I told you that story, okay? This is a true story, as all my sons are. It's called uh, One Eyed Grandma. And this is about my grandmother, who uh, was a wonderful musician as a young girl. And um, my great grandmother played actually piano for the silent movies in Newark, New Jersey. I'm actually from New Jersey, but I hide the accent well, as you can tell. Do you guys have an accent? Can you say car? Say car. car. Say wash. wash. You don't say wash? No. When I grew up, we say wash. Yeah, How do you say camera? This is, is it North Jersey? Or? How do you say it? Camera. Camera. I grew up with a new, with a kind of a northeastern Jersey accent, which sounds almost like a New York accent, but not quite, you know, and. Uh, but when I opened practice in Mukunji, I wanted to relate to the Mukunjiites, so I uh, had to get rid of my New Jersey accent and pretend I was Pennsylvania Dutch like they were. My name almost sounds, my name's Rentler, but Rentschler is Pennsylvania Dutch. So they'd say, your name's Rentschler, right, Doc? I said, well, no, it's Rentler. You're sure it's not Rentschler? I mean, they're arguing with my name. No, it's Rentler. Oh, so you're not Dutch, huh? And I'd say, no, and say, well, you know, Doc, if you're not Dutch, you're not much. That's it. But anyway, so my grandmother was this very talented woman, but she had this terrible accident when she was 14 years old. A string of the violin broke and hit her in the eye, and it blinded her. This is a true story. And it opacified and made her eye all white. Did you ever see Marilyn Manson? How many go to Marilyn Manson concerts here? No. There he is. There's a Marilyn Manson fan in every group. So he has this eye contact lens that makes his eye look white and scary. You've seen him. It's just this horrible looking monstrous kind of thing. So my grandmother looked like that. She had this one eye that was all white. So grandma would come over and she was scary, you know, because she looked scary. And, and um, she stopped playing fiddle and she started to drink and uh, spent her lifetime drinking and smoking and taking and reading the horoscopes and coming over every couple months and giving us a lot of bad mojo. So this is a song that I wrote about my grandma. What was weird though is she would drink and smoke in front of us but talk about Prevention Magazine and how sugar was white death. <laughs> We'd be sitting there and she'd say, you know, that, that sandwich, that's white bread, that's white death, you know. And we're like, you know, we're eight-year-old kids and 
why is my mother giving us death, you know? And so it was pretty weird. Um, so this is called One-Eyed Grandma, and it's probably a true story, but I had to wait till she had passed away to write it and record it. And um, it also mentions my mom, who grew up under that grandma, so can you imagine my mom didn't necessarily have her marbles all together either, so God bless her. She had a little problem with the drink as well. So um, pretty serious problem with it. Um, but the story has redemption. That's the good news, is you don't have to follow these family patterns of darkness. That's a happy thought, I hope. So I will get done soon, Drew, I promise. I got one or two more songs, I'll be done. So this is called One-Eyed Grandma, it's a blues. And you can sing along in the chorus, I'll teach it to you. I got a one-eyed grandma, and you know she loves to imbibe. I got a one-eyed grandma, and you know she loves to drink right. When she comes over to visit, I look for a place to hide. Ah, oh, when grandma was a little girl, she played the violin. One day a string broke and did her eye in. So she put down the fiddle and she picked up a bottle of rye. Now I got a one-eyed grandma and you know we don't see eye, do I? Oh, grandma used to tell me that sugar was white death. Hey, grandma, can I light you up another cigarette? It's amazing to me that she lived to be 85. When she spent most of her lifetime completely anesthetized. One-eyed grandma, and you know she loves to imbibe. I do this at vacation Bible schools. I got a one-eyed grandma, and you know she loves to drink right. When she comes over to visit, I look for a place to hide. Grandma used to tell me that I was a Capricorn. She said I'd have bad luck from the day that I was born. Well, I thank you, Grandma, for building my self-esteem. Well, if it wasn't for Jesus, my best friend would be Jim Bean. Ah, the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. I got a mama who likes her cheap whiskey. Well, mama and my grandma both love the fruit of the vine. And when they get together, those sparks, those sparks are gonna fly. I got a one-eyed grandma, and you know she loves to imbibe. You can sing along. I got a one-eyed grandma, and you know she loves to drink right, yeah. When she comes over to visit, I look for a place to hide. I look for a place to hide. Oh, well, I know this story's been sad, and I'm not too proud, but there's a silver line into this hereditary cloud, because I thank my grandma for giving me this musical gene. And that three-string violin that she left me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, do I have time for one more song? One more? Is that okay? Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Um, when I saw Drew, uh, that he was, I was opening for him, I, I get very intimidated, you know, and it's, oh my gosh, this guy sings so well. You guys are in for a real treat. I was just like looking at all this stuff and his reviews and everything, oh, you know. But I, we were chatting when I got here, and he's a really nice guy, so all that fear I had was not necessary. He's, he's a normal guy, and I feel better about that. So you'll enjoy his show. He's amazing. He sings and plays very nicely. Um, so this song is three minutes and 42 minutes, 42, 
42 seconds long. It's called Scarecrow's Lament. It's the title track of one of my CDs over there. If, uh, I have CDs for sale. Uh, please buy one. I have a YouTube channel. Go to that and subscribe. I have a Spotify and all that other stuff. Facebook. Facebook's where I put most of my daily content and silly songs on different instruments. So this is a true story, as all my songs have been tonight, about The Wizard of Oz. How many people have not seen The Wizard of Oz? Oh, good. So you all know what I'm talking about. When I was growing up, it was a phenomenon. They played every once a year. It would be on. It, man, it was like so amazing, and it, it was really scary at the time. But later in life, I got a DVD of it when I was a, a grown up, and I noticed when they, I would sometimes be drinking way too much coffee very late at night, about three in the morning, and I put the DV on, DVD on of Wizard of Oz when Dorothy and the Scarecrow on the were on the uh, Yellow Brick Road. And I would roll it in reverse, and you have to do that. So if you, it's got to be after three in the morning, and you got to put it in reverse. And there's a scene on the Yellow Brick Road where Dorothy and the, and and the Scarecrow's eyes just meet. You know what I'm saying? And you just know, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, they're in love. They got a thing going, right? But he, she was like 15. He was like 30, right? In some places, that's illegal, I suspect. So I wrote this song about that uh, forbidden love. and um, But I placed it in the 1970s when I kind of was coming of age. So it's called, I wrote this on the way to work one morning, actually. I had this idea. I um, can't say I loved being a doctor every moment. I was always thinking of things. So I wrote most of it on a napkin in my car. star-crossed lovers They stepped out of the rolls one moonless night They borrowed Dorothy's uncle's old Camaro They drove it right across the Kansas line They're about an hour outside of Tulsa Listening to eight tracks and driving way too fast Proud Mary, she never sounded better Siren blast. Oh, Annie Am, where are you when I need you? We're in a storm of trouble now. And these old red slippers must have lost their magic. Maybe you can send a couple foul. The officer was a little less than cordial. But Dorothy charmed him with her ruby reds. She got to ride shotgun back to Kansas. While the scarecrow, he got handcuffed to the feds. The hanging judge, he threw the book at Scarecrow. Fifteen will get you twenty, you should be ashamed. Could have saved yourself a lot of trouble. Mr. Scarecrow, if you only had a brain. Oh, Annie M., where are you when I need you? We're in a storm of trouble now. And these old red slippers must have lost their magic. Maybe you can send a couple foul. Dorothy's back in Kansas doing homework. Scarecrow's in the slammer doing time. Some days seem longer than others when he can't get Dorothy off his mind. Some nights he dreams of flying monkeys. Some days he fears he's gone insane. He's studying to be a malpractice lawyer. 
amazing what you can do without a brain. Oh, N.A.M., where are you when I need you? We're in a storm of trouble now. And these old red slippers must have lost their magic. Maybe you can send a couple foul. Oh, N.A.M., where are you when I need you? We're in a storm of trouble now. And clicking my heels together just ain't working. Can't send a couple foul. Maybe you can send a couple foul. Maybe you can send a couple foul. Thank you so much. Thank you.
We can wait if you want to wait.
moving up, moving out, and move me along, and move me to the end of your line. Gibson, and uh, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I am from Virginia, and I drove up today from Northern Virginia and brought the storms with me. So you're welcome. Um, I thought I thought I was leaving it behind, but they're big fans of Drew Gibson music, so they come with me wherever I go. <laughs> Um, but I always really appreciate when you, you know, when you travel um, to places that, you know, are not where you're from, not where you know anyone, and people show up. Um, it uh, means a lot. And um, so, thank you, Russ. And I were talking. I don't know if you know this, but Russ talks a lot. Um, <laughs> but we were talking, he's a really nice guy. I was just a little joke. Um, we were talking how, you know, he's like, you know, I, I've played shows where no one showed up. And I said, I've never played shows where no one showed up. No. I said, yeah, me too. And uh, uh, so we were commiserating a little earlier and it was, it was fun. Um, it's nice to know that every uh, uh, musician is like you and is as jaded as you are. It's, it's good to know, because it's not easy. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, would, you know, we're in Jersey, but are you in the country here? Like, uh, what do you call it? Do you call it, oh, we're country? Uh, what do you call it? Jersey country? <laughs> um, you know, Virginia, we call it country, but... Uh, I lived in Cleveland, and... There are, there, you know, the east side of Cleveland, the far east side is rural, very rural, just like this. And um, I lived in Cleveland for three years, and I wrote this song when I moved out and lived in a converted pony stable. <laughs> the walls were really thin, and my neighbor was interesting. My mom and dad spent the night one night um, and visited me, and in the morning, my mom and dad are looking at each other, talking about my neighbor, and I was like, well, 
what's, did you hear something over there? And she goes, Andrew Gibson, I think you have a wild woman living next door. <laughs> with me tonight and uh, by the end there might be papers everywhere um, not that I always need these papers but um, sometimes I need them and uh, I was um, playing a show uh, with a full band uh, in DC and you know at the end of the night I had all these sheets all over the floor and I'm packing up and the sheets were gone and someone stole all the lyric sheets off the stage. And I, I mean, I don't know if they have the wrong impression of me, but um, it's not, you know, it's not worth anything. It's, I took a bunch of my scribble home. But uh, um, I, have a, I have a CD, a few CDs here. I know Russ has uh, some CDs over there and um, if you uh, would like one, I'd love to just give you one. Um, I know I have an intimidating sign over there that says they're ten dollars, but uh, I would just love to hand you one, one and uh, send you home with something. So please go home with something. Um, I guess it's worth more to get it in your hands and have you listen than, than not. Um, do you all know what compact discs are? <laughs> It's a really, really cool thing. <laughs> but uh, my first CD was called Letterbox, and uh, <clears throat> the song is uh, called Letterbox. And um, 
my, my mom thought that it was called Litter Box. <laughs> One day I'm just going to replace those words in the song and sing Litter Box and see if anyone catches <laughs> the change. Picture tucked in my belt Satisfies my sense of doubt. Nothing's better felt than your kiss on the way up. Your arms around my waist. I'm ticking of that wall clock. Sunlight. So divine, only you sweet as sweet can be. Gonna move up that mountainside and promise you what you promised me. to talk about my grandmother. <laughs> Her name was Mildred. And uh, Mildred loved cake. Cake, cake, cake. And uh, I 
I guess it was about oh, maybe 15 years ago, um, maybe longer, I can't quite remember. Uh, um, we had a 50th wedding anniversary party for my parents. And um, my parents had their 25th anniversary when I was like six. Um, so uh, we had their 50th anniversary party and my grandma was at a home. I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and my grandma was in a home and in a wheelchair. And um, she was 91 at the time, and <clears throat> she was she was chowing down on some cake, and you know cake all over her lap, cake, cake, cake. It was good cake, and uh, she had a sweet tooth. Um, and uh, she she said, "I was so excited about this anniversary party, I forgot my teeth." <laughs> but you don't need teeth to eat cake. It's a good thing. <laughs> I do have some songs about uh, regarding my grandmother, but um, I think I, I need to not play any more slow ones for now. Piano was my first instrument, and uh, piano is one of those things that 
it's not very fun to learn. And but when you're an adult, you wish you had stuck with it. And um, I didn't stick with it. Um, I did it for about four or five years, and uh, I started when I was eight, and I was very excited because um, I loved music and I loved uh, you know songs on the radio and. I watched a lot of movies when I was really young, and most of the stuff that I learned that was music was songs I heard in movies. Like, I learned about CCR's uh, Born on the Bio from watching Swamp Thing 2. It's, it rolls over the end credits, if you didn't know that. And I was like, this song is, this is awesome song. I like this song. Um, and then I learned about Shake, Rattle, and Roll from uh, the movie Clue. <laughs> But, um, so I started uh, learning piano as eight and my mom picked me up for my first piano lesson um, to go straight to the piano lesson from school and I was very excited. And she handed me a, a spiral notebook because that's what you know you needed to write all the lessons in your spiral notebook and um, that's where all your notes would be. And my mom said, your piano teacher, before we get there, wants you to write three songs that you'd like to learn on piano. So I wrote three songs and um, I wrote Star Wars. Chariots of Fire, and the love theme to Superman. And, uh, I, and I still have this spiral notebook. If you don't believe me, I will text you a picture of the spiral notebook. And um, it's even in my handwriting of those three songs. And I don't know why an eight-year-old would want to learn the love theme to Superman. Um, I guess this had something to do with how much I liked movies and everything. But, um, I, uh, I quit because I never learned the love theme of Superman. Um, but I played piano and it gave me a foundation which was nice but I started playing guitar because I found a guitar at home when I was 12 and started to learn on that and, um, and that guitar was this old Gibson guitar um, and uh, it was my mom's um, younger brother's guitar when he had it. It was a 1958 Gibson LG1. Um, you know, not, a, not something that's incredibly valuable but um, it's a very nice sentimental thing to have. And he passed away when he of leukemia when he was 13. So my family kept this guitar and that's what I learned on. And uh, I wrote this song um, about uh, me finding that guitar and uh, learning music and, and eventually deciding that this is something I would like to, to do. And uh, my, <laughs> my love-hate relationship with uh, a career in this industry, I guess. It's called Lorelei. Within the laws, underneath an awful skin, and drawn into a room where a spirit once had been. So much different now than if you knew me back when I was nowhere. And she walked in. i 
has a picket, it's grown tired of its growth. The tangled briar in it's never seen a soul. Some that's born within them, a cause and won't let go. A worry that's relentless, devoted to not so. How you smoke in the morning fire, then extinguished by day's end. You sink in a shadow, hope to ascend to empty hands, fill a heart, to fill rooms, make a show. The songs you sing, and miss the most. Thank you. <clears throat> so I um, that song Lor called Lorelei, and I Lorelei is a um, uh, taken from a, like a German folk tale and some literature and poems and things, and it's a the Lorelei Rock is in, is in Germany on the Rhine River, and the the tale is that. Um, there was a um, woman named Lorelei, and uh, <clears throat> she was scorned by her lover, and um, so she was very upset, and so she was accused of bewitching men, and so she was um, sentenced to a nunnery, and the knights were taking her to the nunnery, and on the way she saw this rock, and she thought she heard something, and she said, can I go, go over there for a second before we go to the nunnery? And they said yes, and so she goes up on the rock, and she looks over into the water, and she thinks she sees her lover, and she falls into the water and dies. And uh, then the tale is that Lorelei is a, um, this siren that people, sailors would hear, and they'd be drawn to the rock. And, uh, they would uh, crash and shipwreck and die. Because <laughs> Lorelai's not, very per not a very good person, I guess. So I'm telling this story at a show, and, you know, in a room with about maybe a little more than this amount of people, and it's in Rockville, Maryland, which is right outside of D.C., and um, at a place called Hank Deedle's Tavern. And I'm telling the story, and I hadn't told the story in probably a year. And I'm like, all right, I want to tell the story, but I don't know if I'm getting it exactly right. Now, this happens. Like, I, I write s songs based on things, and then I kind of forget the details of those things. Um, people say that doesn't happen. That's just because they're keeping up with it, and I don't do that. Um, so I'm telling the, the story of Laure Lorelei, but I told it a little bit wrong. And wouldn't you know, there was a, some professor in the audience who was like, oh, you know, I, but you got the story wrong. Who this guy at Hank Deedle's Tavern in Rockville, Maryland, there was a story of Lorelei. And I happen to tell it wrong and he corrects me. <laughs> oh well. So inspired by Yeah. Inspired, yeah, based on a not so true story. Something like that. Now I feel like I really have to get it. showcase an in the round thing four song you know four people and you go one 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 you go around and round and round and uh, this I was on the end and there's this girl songwriter next to me and then two more and something was wrong with her guitar I don't know what was wrong with it so I was just like well you can just borrow mine and I'll just hand it to you after I play and she said oh that'd be great and uh, so I play a song and I hand her a guitar and she's playing you know 
And she's like, there's something wrong with your guitar. And I've forgotten to tune it back to standard tuning before I handed her a guitar because I use a couple different tunings and um, I felt really, really, really bad. And she was at Hank Deedle's Tavern. <laughs> That's true, she was there. She came to the show and I hadn't seen her like since then. So I told that story. The song is called Lonnie, Lonnie Johnson. Thank you. 
Thank you. You guys doing okay? Yes. Stan. Good. Attention span is a hard thing to gauge as a performer sometimes. And um, especially when you're, <clears throat> you know, in a listening environment. And you're tuning your guitar and you don't have much to say. And everyone's just waiting in awkward silence. So I'm working on, I, so I have four, I have four records that I've made. <clears throat> um, and I'm recording another. Uh, should be out later on this year. And um, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna try to play a couple here from the new record. <clears throat> These are nice and fresh and um, which means, um, I, I, you know, I don't play them as well as I really want. <laughs> Dog. 
save the other new one, uh, mainly because it starts in the same chord. I don't want to do that right now. But, um... I don't even remember what time we really started. I started my set. Do you, Dan? Okay. So I got a good another hour and a half, I guess. what you're doing now.
for you all. Um, I have um, an album called 1532 and uh, <laughs> this is why I got papers all over the place. file cabinet. <laughs> and um, 1532, my, my dad had an older brother. <clears throat> so my parents were uh, older than my contemporaries' parents. And I have a sister who's about 13 years older than I am. My dad had an older brother who was significantly older than he was. And um, in 1943, he was going to um, fight in World War II from Richmond, Virginia. And um, before he left to go to, uh, I guess training was in Miami, Florida. And uh, before he left for training, he wanted to put the family's house number on his car license plate. And then he was leaving and going to World War II. And um, so he did that. and. Uh, they lived at 1505, but 1505 wasn't available. It was taken. So he got 1532, where the three and two equal five. 
um, and put it on his, his license plate. <clears throat> and my my uh, grandfather, his father, actually got 1533. He was like, oh, cool idea. I'll, I'll get 1533. Um, they didn't live at 1506, but he got 1533. So um, uh, Uncle Jack went to uh, Miami, and then from there he, he ended up in Italy with a bombardment group in Italy. And um, he didn't return home. And um, so the family kept his license plate, and it was then put on um, his father's car. And um, when he passed away, uh, it was put on my grandmother's car. And my grandmother, uh, my dad's mom, passed away a few months after I was born. And after she passed away, my father put it on his car. And my father has had the license plate on um, until my, my dad passed away. And now my mom has it on her car. And over the years, uh, this gesture of you know, a trivial thing of just putting a number on a license plate. It's been kept and it's just kind of grown in significance since 1943 and it's still on a car license plate. Um, and uh, it's kind of become a, a family number um, in a way, like like a, 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 a family seal or whatnot. Um, but um, I, uh, after my dad passed away, I was at um, my mom and dad's house and I was in a closet and I found this lockbox and I opened it up and I vaguely remember seeing this lockbox before but um, and maybe have known of the contents in it when I was really young. But I didn't really um, remember the story of 1532. I mean, I you know, when you're a kid, you know your dad, you know, my dad's got this license plate, you know, you're a kid, I don't really know um, why. Um, but um, I was reminded of the story I found this lockbox, and in the lockbox was all of the letters that Jack had written home while he was um, in Italy. And it also had the original, um, I guess it's Western Union, um, telegram telling um, uh, his parents that he had died in World War II. Um, and he didn't die in combat, but they don't even really know what happened. They said it was some sort of accident that happened, but so reading all these letters um, that he had written, and I see him writing about my father in there, and it's really interesting. So I wrote this song um, called 44, I've gone across an easy line. Landed boats at the foot of the Apennines. Ten fades down as the moon ignites. I hope all is strong back home.
Russ for uh, playing and opening up for us. I enjoyed your stories. <laughs> it's so funny because my wife always says, um, you need to, you should, I like it when you tell stories. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it's, it, it does take a certain um, atmosphere for that to work. This is one of those places where it does work. Um, rowdy bar, not so much. But, but uh, again, thank you so much. Um, come say hello. Uh, I will hand you. Can take a CD. Um, can hand you a CD. I also have T-shirts, but I probably don't carry your size. <laughs> I was talking to Dan earlier about T-shirts and how inventory is such a pain to like keep track of that, but. Got some larges. I've got one triple X large. Um, but uh, again, thank you so much. This is a song I wrote when I lived in Cleveland, Ohio. So the song is, I don't know, 20 years old. And it's on my first record out in the letterbox. By the way, you can hear all of this music, um, you know, on the internet. I think if everyone goes home and streams a song 10 times, I'll get paid 0.3 cents. But I lived in Cleveland and uh, I knew this girl, we were working in the same school and um, she moved back to town because she was separated and had come back to, to Cleveland. And uh, we became friends, and I really wasn't quite sure what the rules were with people who are separated and not divorced. And, you know, I'm in my 20s, and I'm like, I don't know what's, you know, can I ask you out? Or is that, am I not supposed to do that? I have no idea. And um, no one would tell me what to do. Um, so I didn't do anything. And, and then uh, she would tell me about all the dates she was going on. And I was like, well, I missed it opportunity I guess and um, she wanted me to get the picture because she knew uh, that I was uh, interested and not very happy about hearing all of her you know activities and um, even though we were friends and so um, she got frustrated and uh, she said to me um, I don't like you I've never liked you and I never will like you I was like, um, are you positive? <laughs> so anyway, what does someone do like me but go home and 
write a beautiful song that she does not deserve. <laughs> and it's even called Wishing You Well. I'm telling the story because I'm still trying to tune this to a G. <laughs> Wishing you well. I'm just a super nice dude. But, um, I, it, well, originally it was called Wishing You Hell. I didn't think that would sound great on the record, but... My mom probably would have been too happy about that. So here we go. Wishing you well. Again, thank you so much. My name is Drew Gibson, and um, I really appreciate you all being here.